Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, the sanctimonious, still sanctimonious, no longer notorious, RMB, here today with Rob Observation's live chat number 105. Wow. Greetings to all you. These, the members of the post-geek singularity community, you imagination connoisseurs here on a Saturday afternoon. What's happening in the world? A lot. A lot is happening in the world, and I wanted to begin, you know, just... Just sharing, the thing is, whatever you think of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, whatever you think of science fiction, fantasy, horror, what's great is when something comes out that we can all agree is an event. Whether you love that event, whether you didn't like that event, whether it was elating to you or disappointing to you, no one can deny that the release of Avengers Endgame is, in fact, a cultural event. And nowhere is that proven more than at the box office. And I just wanted to read this to you. This is from Deadline, which is pretty much an online. In, there's, there's Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, and basically Deadline, which is covers the business, the up-to-date business of the entertainment uh, world. And uh, when something is on Deadline, you know, I usually take it as, as gospel, especially when they're talking about money, because the whole industry looks at it. This was... Uh, published at 10.50 a.m. this morning, PST, so uh, about an hour and 20 minutes ago, perhaps. Um, let me read this to you. The headline says, Avengers Endgame thunders to $487 million overseas and $644 million global through, not today, through Friday, yesterday. $644 million dollars yesterday smashes all-time opening weekend records on way to a historic 1.1 billion dollar worldwide bow and let me read this the second saturday update disney marvel's avengers endgame has now collected 487 uh, 487 million dollars worth of infinity stones at the international box office that's through friday and does not include an estimated 82.4 million in China on Saturday, which pushes Iron Man, Cap, Thor, and the gang across the $300 million mark in the Middle Kingdom. With domestic's $156.7 million estimate through Friday, the global total, again, excluding China Saturday, is $643.7 million. We are looking at a worldwide opening of over $1.1 billion, an all-time and mind-boggling industry record. Overseas, the $487 million through Friday already breaks the record for the highest opening weekend internationally ever, topping the fate of the Furious's $443 million, which had China in the opening suite. The global total through Friday is also a new benchmark overtaking the highest worldwide opening weekend, which was previously set by Avengers Infinity War with 641 million and no China. So however you slice this, this is this is huge, huge numbers uh, for the movie. I mean, what's obviously there was a, a global just just hunger to see this film just kind of like the hunger galactus might have to eat the earth one day in the marvel cinematic universe i know that uh this was probably my most eagerly awaited film uh in my lifetime since empire strikes back for an old school geek like myself i was certainly as i said a couple of chats ago not disappointed i've seen the movie twice now i'm gonna go see it again in imax because it was i think only the second movie entirely shot with imax cameras which means there's a little bit more uh, on the top and bottom of the screen. The aspect ratio is different in IMAX. And in Infinity War, that was particularly apparent with all the scenes of Thanos because if you watch uh, Infinity War as it's being presented on home video and on streaming, it's presented in the 239 uh, to 1 aspect ratio, widescreen aspect ratio. And, and it's, a little, it's a little cramped. So I can't wait to see an IMAX 3D at the Chinese... I'm going with my oldest friend in, in L.A., David Hargrove, who I met at USC in the fall of 1988. And he also works in the industry, so we love going to see genre movies together, and we have these long, rollicking conversations that last pretty much all afternoon. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's amazing. It's an amazing time. It's great to see this kind of excitement. And tomorrow, 
It's the battle battle of Winterfell, yo. Uh, we've been waiting for that for another a decade, pretty much. Battle of Winterfell. Who is going to survive? Who you got? Tell me who's in your Deadpool. I think Brienne of Tarth. She ain't gonna make it. Uh, her story ended last last week. Well, it didn't quite end, but she was knighted. She will die a knight, and I think that's about it for her. But you never know. But I do think Brienne is going to bite the dust tomorrow. That's just a prediction. I have no foreknowledge of that. What do you guys think? Tell me. Now, this is going to be a little different. Um, I'm not going to read any letters today. Uh, not that I haven't been getting lots of great letters. It's just I read something today that was actually written and posted on Facebook that I thought worth sharing from the great Doug Drexler. Doug Drexler is one of my favorite people in Hollywood. Him and his wife, uh, Dorothy Duder. I just call her the Duder because I think it's great that her last name is Duder. I mean, I guess it would be Drexler, but she kept her own name, I think. I don't know. Either way, Doug and, and Dorothy uh, Duder Drexler are two of the coolest people in Los Angeles. I've loved them for years, decades, actually. Um, and Doug is an Academy Award winner. He won an Academy Award for makeup effects working on Dick Tracy, richly deserved, I might add. Uh, he then famously went to work on the Star Trek shows in the art department, and he basically taught himself uh, how to work in digital and created the NX-01. Uh, he digitally modeled the NX-01 for Enterprise, and then he, of course, digitally modeled the famous refit that is not canonical, but it kind of is. And uh, it's pretty great. You can you can even get a model kit of Drexler's refit. It basically, they added a secondary hull to the NX-01, making it look more redolent of the Constitution class. But Doug is, he, he, he is a longtime fan, but he goes back into the, into the seventies. He's one of the, the original Star Trek fans that existed. And, and it was funny, Larry Nemechek taught me a term that I did not, as long as I was in the Star Trek fandom, I had not heard this term. Of course, Larry Nemechek has written uh, many books about Star Trek and he, he does a weekly show about Star Trek. He's a great guy. We interviewed him a number of times for the next generation Blu-rays, but ne Larry Nemechek taught me this term called backgrounder. And he called himself a backgrounder, and Doug Drexler would, would also be fall into this category. And backgrounders were people that were trying to fill in the background of the Star Trek universe. And when I've talked often about loving these books called the Best of Trek uh, anthologies from the magazine for Star Trek fans, like when I was growing up, I'd never seen the magazine Trek, but I had bought, I think, Signet put them out, and there's there's got to be like almost 20 of them, Best of Trek uh, anthologies, and they were deep dives, essays that were deep dives into the background and the history of the Star Trek universe, all extrapolations by basically fan writers, but some really interesting stuff. There was somebody named Leslie Thompson, who I never knew was either a guy or a girl, who did a series of columns called Star Trek Mysteries Solved and went into these things. Well, so Doug is, you know, he he worked, I, I don't know the name of the, the, I think it was the Federation Outpost. It was in New York. It was a Star Trek store basically a fan store i know he he worked there or founded it or something but back in the day anyway so doug drexler in my mind he's kind of like one of the ef huttons of fandom when doug talks you listen <laughs> kind of uh and and he's just a delightful human being and he's great to be around and if you want to hear more from doug he was actually we did an inglorious trexperts podcast with him recently uh on have gun will travel which was a Western series that it was all about Paladin. If you ever saw the movie Stand By Me, they actually sing the theme song at one point in the film. Uh, but it was a show that Gene Roddenberry worked on before Star Trek. And it, it's a great Western show. And it's basically about a guy named Paladin. He was a gun for hire. Um, and if you haven't discovered the joys of how gun will travel, you can get the whole series on home video. Um, and then Doug, Doug has a, a great affinity for the show. And he is on our episode talking about Roddenberry's involvement. It's a great episode of Inglorious Trexperts. That is a podcast I am a frequent guest on, so check that out. But Doug wrote something that he posted on Facebook today. And I know not everybody's friends with, with Doug Drexler on Facebook, and many people might not even know who he is, but he is on Facebook. And he wrote an article, a piece that I, it, it really spoke to me, not surprisingly, because as I said, when Doug Drexler speaks, uh, you have to listen. And it, it's interesting because he hasn't written stuff like this before, or maybe he has and I just haven't you know, read it lately. But this was a piece that 
it really spoke to me and it, it spoke to a lot of kind of the conversations we've been having here between you and me and the, the rest of the post geek singularity. So I'm, I'm going to share what he posted on Facebook. It's a little long, but uh, I think it's worth reading and it's certainly pertinent to the end of the Orville ended uh, the uh, Star Trek discovery of course ended the Marvel cinematic universe ended. And of course, Game of Thrones is ending, but this is an article that he wrote called The Powerful Psychology of Continuity, and it even has a graphic. I don't know if he just wrote this for himself or if it appeared in some other journal, so my apologies if it appeared somewhere else, but Doug posted it on Facebook. I did contact Doug this morning. I asked him if it was okay if I read this on the show because, man, it is food for thought and uh, one of the best things that I've read in a long time regarding my at least my brand of fandom which i think some of you feel the same way so without further ado this comes from doug drexler confessions of a continuity junkie on a cultural level star trek has meant more than anyone would ever have expected that's something you can't know until a good chunk of time has passed Clearly, the most important impact that Star Trek has had on our society is the catalyst it has been in making people excited about the future. These days, that is an anomaly. Here is one of the basic rules of the universe. Dream positive and big. Get positive and big. Dream dysfunctional, get dysfunctional. If you haven't learned that yet, get after it. So why is Star Trek so powerful? And why does it resonate so soundly with its fans? For one thing, it is about ideas. It's about surprising people with new ways to look at things, sometimes really big things. God, petty nationalism, the waste of war. The idea that love is not black or white, but comes in many shades. You know, Star Trek was saying these things long before it was fashionable. And for Star Trek to remain as smart as it has been, it needs to continue to ask uncomfortable questions because that is where the best Star Trek, the best drama, comes from. It's about inspiration. There was a time where I thought that maybe my job on Star Trek was a little on the frivolous side, playing with spaceships and ray guns. Then I witnessed the stream of visitors to the show. Mars rover drivers from JPL, astronauts, heads of state, Ronald Reagan, the King of Jordan, the Dalai Lama, I was there when Stephen Hawking asked to be lifted out of his wheelchair and put in the captain's chair. I can't tell you how many times scientists have told me that they became who they are because of Star Trek. But there is an even more basic and primal motivator designed into Star Trek by its creator, which has grown its influence and popularity exponentially. Continuity, the engine block of its fan devotion and something that has been cultivated carefully and over time. The powerful psychology of continuity. Continuity, the state or quality of being continuous, an uninterrupted succession or flow, a coherent whole. As Psychology Today said, familiarity breeds enjoyment and comfort. Star Trek is comfort. Comfort is knowing that your favorite meal, artist, music, friend, is there for you. You count on a delightful flavor, a brush stroke, a riff, a smile. Spock found comfort in his friend Kirk's ironclad continuity of character and described it thusly. If I drop a hammer on a positive gravity planet, I do not need to see it fall to know that it has indeed fallen. Spock counted on the continuity of his captain's thought processes and likened them to the steadfastness of gravity itself. Continuity sums up Star Trek and its half century of logic defines oh, <laughs> and its half century of logic defying success. It is the joy of knowing its history, its taste, and its texture, knowing it will be there as sure as gravity, like a favorite song whose rhythm and melody you anticipate, and ultimately the joy that accompanies the fulfillment of that promise. Part of the reason for the enormous success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is its incredible inner logic and continuity. The spotty success of the DC film universe has been its unpredictable adherence to inner logic. By allowing every new director to reinvent characters based on personal tastes, 
they have hobbled a potentially monstrous franchise. Outstanding quality control and inner logic supersedes the director at Marvel. And it is the reason it has become the cinematic juggernaut that it is. Roddenberry knew how to grow the Star Trek fan base. He understood the power of engendering a proprietary attitude in, it, in his fans. He did this by working to make sure that they felt a part of the show and that they were not just spectators. He did it by making sure that the melody and rhythm fans anticipated were there and like a favorite song resulted in that all important feel good endorphin cascade in the seminal work. The making of Star Trek by Stephen E. Whitfield, Rodden Roddenberry referred to it as the believability factor and it applies equally to technology, characters, and the tapestry of its history, or as I would say, verisimilitude. As a calculated plan to cement and assure the future success of Star Trek, Roddenberry wisely suggested that Michael and Denise Akuda organize a compendium of facts, aesthetics, and historical pivot points so that the show's writers and ultimately its fans would believe in this sprawling universe, engage their pituitary glands, and bask in the warm cascade of endorphins. It is the irresistible charm and promise of being able to invest your time in understanding it both dramatically and aesthetically and be assured of the validity of that time. Sacrificing consistency would erode the willingness of fans to commit to invest in it by buying books, blueprints, and model kits. In other words, that sense of validity gives you permission to indulge yourself. Another no less calculated and powerful endorphin getter is the joy of being able to strike up a conversation with any devotee in any part of the world and be able to discuss, debate, and speculate the details. This is possible because of Star Trek's carefully built and adhered to inner logic and continuity. This intuitive structure is the foundation of its magic. That foundation supports all 600 plus hours. Design aesthetic. Similarly, the visual aesthetic of Star Trek carefully nurtured a sense of reality and continuity by avoiding Starfleet designs that are science fiction-y and based flatly on what is perceived as cool. Cool for cool's sake is cotton candy. There can be no substance to it, and it cannot withstand the test of time. Design practicality, form following function, and dogged adherence to established design history is one of Trek's superpowers. The best Starfleet designs are those that exhibit a basic understanding of real-world technology. The more the audience examines it, the more layers it reveals, the more evidence that it's been thought out, and the more fun and interactive it becomes. Trek designers like Akuda, Sternbach, and Probert knew where it's all going, how it comes apart, and what it does. We relish that part of it, and that's what gives it its pedigree. The fun and linchpin of the Starfleet design aesthetic essential to its ability to capture the imagination is, once again, consistent inner logic. Fans can identify a phaser strip, a characteristic warp nacelle from a specific era, an airlock, or a lifeboat hatch. This is the sport. Fans crave being in the know. Devotees love learning the ins and outs. How stringently production adheres to such contrivances will be equaled by a return in fan devotion. Works such as the Star Trek Encyclopedia and the various tech manuals make writing and designing for Star Trek that much more difficult. Trek writing staffs have long felt hogtied by what was perceived as restrictive rules and regulations. But consider this. Director-writer Nicholas Meyer, a man credited with saving Star Trek with the Wrath of Khan, once said, Creativity demands boundaries and thrives on restrictions. Sentimentality. Sentimentality is powerful and something Star Trek has built on for half a century. In Star Trek's second pilot, where no man has gone before, Sulu says, Take a penny, double it every day, in a month you'll be a millionaire. That sums up Star Trek fandom but you need that first penny in order to make it work. Sentimentality is impossible to achieve without continuity. Continuity has long been a Star Trek god, and it has imbued a seemingly endless durable universe with supernatural longevity. Its success is a complex tapestry, but it is a fickle god, and if you pull out certain threads, the tapestry may unravel. Continuity and sentimentality is the fragile thread which runs through Star Trek, giving it its tensile strength. 
but it is also the fire in which it burns. This magic architecture requires reliability and steadfast nurturing. Fans must be able to count on Star Trek, otherwise they will learn not to count on it, lose faith, get discouraged, and become cynical. We've all experienced the power of continuity. Muscles aren't made overnight. They are formed through repetition and consistency. It is the same for the muscles of the mind, spirit, and yes, Star Trek, and its fandom. It is a decidedly universal constant. Human beings are continuity and comfort-seeking organisms, and we respond to those things in everything we do. This is the cornerstone of Star Trek. It is the joy of knowing its history, its taste, and its texture, dramatically and aesthetically. And knowing it will be there like the Rock of Gibraltar and as surely as gravity. Doug Drexler. Now, I, I read that, obviously, for, for those who come to know me on these, on these chats, uh, you would know that this certainly spoke to <laughs> what I love about Star Trek and, indeed, what I love about most of my the things that I'm fans of. And the first thing I know you're going to say is that, well, he brought up the Marvel, the Marvel Universe, the comic book universe, and they change continuities all the time. They retcon. They do, but people don't like it as much. And I think as far as comic books are concerned, you know, the audience is a fickle one, and they're always trying to get new readers, just like, say, Star Trek needs to get new viewers. But the I think, as, as Doug so eloquently put it, once you're pulling at that tapestry of continuity, your fandom starts to fall away. And, and unless that is, is understood, we sort of lose what it is that makes Star Trek fandom so unique amongst pop culture. Um, and of course, you know, Doug wasn't referring to anything specific, but I think that his point is well taken. It certainly was by me. And I really love that piece of writing um, that Doug did. And I, I don't know what you guys think about it, but I did think it was it was pretty spot on. And, and that's what I sort of wanted to read today because it, it's really, it's funny. I've been thinking a lot about continuity and I've been thinking a lot about, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos of George R.R. R. Martin speaking. There's a great interview I was watching where I guess it, it's in excerpts, but it was him and Stephen King on stage somewhere. And they're talking about writing and developing things and, and world building because world building has always been to me the essential cornerstone of any, any fandom of some fictional world begins with the fact that the universe itself is well considered even though my Burnett axiom has always been never put your universe before your characters but it's important that once you have great characters they inhabit a believable universe and the first thing that anybody has has to do when they are building a fictional universe is dare I say it bring verisimilitude to it you have to believe in every aspect of the universe and I think if if you've ever read Game of Thrones now Truth be told, I've only read the first book. I read the first book when it came out, I want to say, in 96. It was funny. I was actually, I was the critic at large for Sci-Fi Universe Magazine. And Mark, we they were, Sci-Fi Universe Magazine was based, it was published by Larry Flint. It was based out of the Flint building on the corner of La Cienica and Wilshire Boulevard, which is a 10-story building. And there, of course, was other, there was Sci-Fi Universe had an office, and there was all kinds of, like, we were next to the office for Chic, which was a porn, all of his porn magazines. So here we were, the nerds writing the the sci-fi magazine for cool people. At least that's what that's. It was a self-professed sci-fi magazine for cool people. We all consider ourselves the cool fans, and indeed we might have been. Who knows? But uh, when we were writing articles, and you'd go to the office, there was a lot of most of the publishers would send us books to read because they hoped we would review the books. And that's I had picked up Game of Thrones. I had been a George R. R. Martin fan for a long time. He, he wrote a, an incredible novel called Fever Dream about vampires on the Mississippi. Uh, he'd written a lot of incredible short stories I, I, had, I had read. He was already a producer and a creator, I think, of the Beauty and the Beast television show with Linda Hamilton that she made following Terminator. He, he was the, the, one of the founders of the Mosaic, the Wild Cards novel series. They were Mosaic novels to start with that now his great friend Melinda Snodgrass and fellow, well, she was a Star Trek writer. She wrote, of course, Measure of a Man. She worked on the show in the, in the second and third season. Uh, and uh, so that's where I was uh, first familiar with Game of Thrones. I, you know, it was one book. But one of the things that made Game of Thrones such a great read 
was he had almost a fetishistic way of a fetishistic way of describing the world, the food, the the fabrics. I mean, it felt so real. And and of course, he based a lot of it on on like the War of the Roses and historical events, and not the War of the Roses, the movie, but the, the actual War of the Roses, and and things that had happened in the past, and and sort of English and European history. So it was informed by reality. There was there was much verisimilitude in in the Game of Thrones novel. And for whatever reason, I mean, fantasy wasn't really my thing, to be honest, but I was really caught up in the whole story of what was going on with, with Eddard Stark and going down to King's Landing and, and all of that. And when the show started, I know the books continued on, but when the show started, I was really excited because it looked like it was I mean, coming on the heels of Lord of the Rings. I mean, I, I've never been a fantasy fan, even though I read the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever, and I read um, Tolkien, and and I had read certain fantasy books. I read the Sword of Shannara when it came out, and but I just wasn't a fan of fantasy. I, for me, I had a hard time suspending disbelief. But with Game of Thrones, especially the first book, it was pretty pretty gritty. But what was so great about that book was the world that it it you, you were dropped into. And I think that one of the great things about um, these flights of fancy, these worlds that we believe in, and, and and as a kid, when I was growing up reading DC Comics and the Justice League, you know, I would love it every year the Justice Society of America and the Justice League would team up. And those are my favorite stories. And there was a continuity there. And I think even from the time I was a little kid, some of my favorite episodes of my of my favorite shows, Star Trek, one of the the greatest, I think one of the greatest conceits of any science fiction, certainly television show, was when they repurposed the unused pilot of Star Trek, The Cage, with Captain Pike and the Talosians and number one. They took that and they used it in the first season two-part episode, The Menagerie. To me, that was brilliant because in my mind as a five-year-old kid, a six-year-old kid, I remember thinking, oh my God, you see the Enterprise Bridge. It's clearly the Enterprise Bridge, but it's not the same. There was those gooseneck lamps with the cobra heads, the view screens, the the costumes were different. Things were different enough. And then it, it took place over a decade previous. The, the event you're watching, or what was it, 13 years, 11 years ago? Uh, it was it was a long time ago, you know, and yet they were Spock was even on the Enterprise a decade prior, more than a decade prior, that was mind blowing when you first watched it. And suddenly the Star Trek universe became a much more believable place. And I don't know how much science fiction television had done that. First of all, there really wasn't any Star Trek, any like-minded shows before Star Trek. I mean, yeah, you had Lost in Space and Lost in Space had sort of a continuity in a way, but then we saw other science fiction shows, my beloved Jerry Anderson's UFO. UFO had continuity. There were two episodes in particular um, that, well, one, Confetti Check A-OK. -okay. And throughout the show, you saw people bounce around. But in Confetti Check A-OK, -okay, you saw the history of Ed Straker's involvement with Shadow over the, the first episode identified opens in 1970. And then we move ahead in the series to 1980. That was in the first episode. And then we jumped back and saw the development of Shadow throughout the 70s in Confetti Check A-OK. -okay. So I, you know, as a kid, I was growing up and I loved continuity and that's what helped you believe in things. Space 1999 did the same thing. Uh, in one of my favorite first season episodes of the series, Dragon's Domain, you flash back and you see uh, what happened to that ill-fated probe. Uh, and it, it they, the Ultra, the ult, was it, I think the Ultra Probe. And uh, the it was, I always love that. I'm like, oh, you get to see like what happened in the past. And continuity is a huge thing when it comes to science fiction, fantasy, horror. And of course, continuity was in comic books and retconning. Even retconning becomes continuity, even though you're like, wait a minute. And it gets a little ridiculous. But what are you going to do with comic book characters that have existed for 75 years? In the case of Batman, now 80 years. I mean... You've kind of got to go back. I mean, Batman's basically been the same age for eight decades, you know? And then when they go back and they do the Dark Knight Returns or something, they they borrow from certain continuities. But continuity in any kind, it's it's always, even when they play on Elseworld stories, continuity becomes a, it's, it's, it's a thing, you know? It relies on your knowledge of the character. If you're going to do a Gotham by Gaslight, you kind of need to be informed by Batman continuity in order to change the venue to, 
the Victorian era, you know, something like that. So continuity is a big thing. It's been a big thing in fandom and especially, especially genre fandom since the very beginning. And, you know, if you're Star Wars, they knew that, you know, when they, they made the force awakens, they didn't sure. They might've changed the dish on the millennium Falcon, but that was because we saw it get knocked off in the end of return of the Jedi. So it made sense. You don't sit there and go, but the millennium Falcons dish is circular. Look, after something gets, it's it's within continuity that that dish could change. When you look at it and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's still the Millennium Falcon with a different dish on it. You know, why does C-3PO have a red arm? I don't know. I mean, I understand that J.J. Abrams' involvement, he wanted a little slice of that merchandising cheddar, and that's why they made those changes. That's why, why, why have R2-D2 be a hero in a seventh movie? And let's, let's create a BB-8. I'm like, well, that was dumb. And then the reason, I mean, they have R2-D2 under a, a tarp, Bad continuity, bad verisimilitude. Don't like that, but I don't want to get into that. But what Doug Drexler was saying about Star Trek, I really liked, and I think you can apply it to all fandoms. And I think one of the great things about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the reason it is conquering the box office on a global scale is because all of us, we live in this, the post-geek singularity world. Where the world, it's no longer, you know, eh, I'm, I'm eating my comic books and all alone in the lunchroom and no one will eat with me. The world has changed. We now live in a world, we live in sci-fi world. And everyone loves science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I mean, maybe not everybody, but for the most part, when you're walking around with a supercomputer that you can FaceTime people with, which was prophesized in many science fiction works <laughs> since the dawn of time, we're now living in that world. We are living in the sci-fi world. Science fiction proved it's right. It, it basically is very prophetic. It, 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 it prophesized all of our modern age. I mean, the details might be different, but so we live in a sci-fi world. That's what the post-geek singularity is. We're no longer geeks. We're the mainstream. And seeing this kind of great success and the reason I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe has such success. And it was very interesting. This morning I was watching uh, Mark Kermode, one of my favorite critics, Mark Kermode, the British critic. He's, he's on the BBC and he's written a number of books and things like that. And he, he's a great critic of genre cinema. And he talked about how much he loved Endgame. And he said, look, for all of its convoluted storytelling, he teared up twice. He even said that. He said, for a movie like this to be able to cast whatever spell that is and reach in and extract emotion from people, even if not all of the movie worked for you, but if you did tear up and you did feel something, that's rare. And there's something going on that's unique in this franchise. Now, I loved Endgame. I loved everything about it. And of course, Mark Kermode said his favorite part of the movie was the first third. If you break it into three acts, he said the first act was his favorite because of the way it dealt with grief. And I I agree with him. I mean, I love all, the, all of the movie equally, but the first act of the film, setting up those characters and watching what is the world like when characters have failed in the previous movie. And that was a really interesting thing. The fact that they did delve into it as much as they did and really thoughtful, really well done. And uh, I, I really think it it, it added, it, it would not have worked if you didn't care about those characters as much. If you didn't have the kind of continuity, the fealty to what had come before that they, they had shown. And I think that's why that movie is doing as well as it is. And, and I think that the great franchises recognize that about their audience. And I just, you know, I wanted to read Doug's article. What do you guys think about that? How do you feel about what Doug said? How does that work for Star Trek? It's really interesting because for me, when it came to Star Trek Discovery, while I have a lot of old friends of mine that are even older than me that like Star Trek Discovery, which I, I can understand, um, and a lot of new fans who aren't, you know, they're seeing Star Trek for the first time, a lack of continuity doesn't bother them in Discovery because they're experiencing it for the first time. They don't know anything different. And then there's this, I think, this ill-conceived notion that, oh, the, the 60s was old, you know, or the, the, which is silly because Star Trek worked in this continuum for 40 years. And um, it is a, a fictitious history of the future. It's not our history. It's a, it's a different history. Um, but anyway, that's a whole nother subject. I mean, I don't want to get into to just being another uh, me bashing current, the state of current Star Trek, awful as it is. But uh, I thought it was interesting. So what do you guys think? How do you feel about that? Um, I, I don't know. So let's, uh, let's, why don't we just jump into 
what you guys are thinking and feeling uh, now. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to allow no, 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 uh, spoilers for end game yet. I mean, I'm doing a huge spoiler discussion, um, with John Campia tomorrow. So we're, we're going to start at noon on the John Campia show on his YouTube channel. So I encourage you to join us there and we're going to spoil the hell out of it. Um, so we'll see. A factual opinion says got 13 more episodes of the original series before getting to TNG. Well, factual opinion. I hope you're, you're delving into the series has been good. Uh, what do you think? I'm sorry. The, th the third season kind of, had a little bit of a change in quality, although there's some good episodes in those last 13. And I think the penultimate episode, All Our Yesterdays, is quite great. Um, <laughs> Stubble McShave says, the Chattering Nuns promo for Good Omens is great. Uh, for those of you who don't know, one of my favorite fantasy books uh, is Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's book, Good Omens, that's been turned into a TV series. And it comes out... Um, uh, on May 31st, it's an Amazon show. Apparently, Gilbert's excited for it. And uh, it's an Amazon show. And they released a promo of these nuns, these chattering nuns, singing a song about the Antichrist. And it is delightful. Uh, what a great promo. The book is great. Uh, the cast looks great. It just looks like everything about Good Omens is going to be amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. Willow Yang says, browser history? Well, if they start rounding up people for what they read and watch, I'm probably going to end up in a cell next to yours. Well, that wouldn't be so bad because I think you and I would have a lot to talk about. And as long as there's um, bars, just sim simply bars between us instead of just walls, I bet we could uh, really enjoy each other's company. <laughs> uh, Terry Flynn is here. Terry Flynn says, Rob, thanks for Kermode's comments. I like him for his non-sci-fi stuff. His insights were interesting. For him to like even part of Endgame was cool. I think so too, Terry. I mean, I, I really like his reviews. I mean, he's been a longtime supporter of Exorcist 3, which is one of my favorite. I, I love Exorcist 3. I think it's got one of the smartest scripts ever written for a horror film. And I think um, his constant pressuring of them trying to find the lost footage was one of the reasons that Scream Factory or Shout Factory was able to release their incredible disc of Exorcist 3 that shows what the movie looked like before they did the reshoots. And um, kudos to him. But I'm a huge Kermode fan. I, I really like his work. He's a guy I would one day love to hang out with and just, just drink pints and pints of ale at a bar. And... Um, uh, just talk movies forever. I mean, you know, my, I think one of them, John Schnepp used to tell me that he had a dream of, he talked about him and his girlfriend, Holly, like moving to London and moving, not moving to London, moving to England and moving somewhere into the countryside and opening a comic book store. And I, you know, I kind of feel that way as well. I mean, I mean, I love pub culture. Like I would love to open a bar, like I'd call it toy bar and just set up all my action figures in the bar in nice lit cases but then also have a reading area and, and I'd be the bartender. <laughs> I'd, be, <laughs> I'd be, you know, drunk half the time, but not, not totally drunk, drunk enough where I could, I could still talk. But I, I think, you know, I want to make some more movies and, and make some more great entertainment, hopefully before I, before I do that. But, you know, I could see spending my twilight years in, in, um, in England, <laughs> maybe then when it, when it gets too much or, you know, my body's failing me, I'll walk on the moors and hopefully I'll get torn apart by, by a werewolf or something. Uh, Willow Yang says, on the bright side in that cell, we'll finally meet in person. <laughs> Indeed we will. And I'm sure that uh, it would be a lot of fun to to hang out and have these discussions, especially when you finish watching the original series. I, I can't wait to, oh, uh, Willow Yang says, she just finished Balance of Terror exclamation point. One of the highlights of the first season uh, one of the great endings of any Star Trek episode as well. I'd be very curious to hear what you think about that. Um, Vesna says that she was shaking when she got out of the cinema. She needed time. I needed time to collect myself. It didn't even happen in Return of the King. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. I agree. Uh, Chinese Deadpool says, I did not cry. It's bullshit. I did not. Oh, hi, Will. I, Chinese Deadpool says, I did not cry. It's bullshit. I did not cry. Oh, hi, Willow Yang. 
I love you guys. Um, Jeff T says, saw the DS9 documentary yesterday that Ira Bear made, really liked it. That's, of course, uh, what we leave behind. It's coming out in theaters, I think, May 13th, one day only. And Shout is picked it up to release on home video. I can't wait to get the Blu-ray of that. Uh, Captain Robert April says, if they can throw $400 million on a misbegotten Picard show, they can damn well do a fifth season of Enterprise. <laughs> well, you know what's pretty funny? I mean, if, if the Viacom uh, Paramount or the Viacom CBS merger happens, I don't understand, like, like they, what they really need to do is they need to, they need to wrest Star Trek away from the bad robot secret hideout, whatever they're doing. And, and they need to, st why not make a Deep Space Nine movie? You know, I mean, uh, they need somebody with a vision to do that. They also need the money but and the will. But there's no reason why they can't do it. I mean, look at what HBO, they bring back Deadwood. You know, they make a two-hour Deadwood movie. I, it's just, it's crazy to me. There is no visionary that understands Star Trek. And you don't start out by spending $300 million on a Star Trek series is what they've spent on Discovery. And you know, three hundred million dollars on Into Darkness. That's 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 how people who don't understand Star Trek and don't understand it from a production standpoint, that's what they do. They think, oh, we're going to make this like any other franchise property. Uh, Alexander Wilson says, "Endgame teared me up." What was the first movie you cried at? I first cried at the Cider House Rules, a movie that was sad and also had Paul Rudd. I love the Cider House Rules, actually. Um, I think Lassie Hallstrom directed that. Who directed? Uh, one of my favorite foreign films, My Life as a Dog. Uh, I love that movie. But yeah, I think the Cider House Rules is I love the Cider House Rules. Honestly, this is gonna seem this is gonna seem I cried in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That was the first time I ever cried in a movie. I cried twice. I cried, of course, a little bit. Not no, I didn't really lose it when Spock and Kirk were sharing that moment as he actually died, but I really lost it when Kirk stumbled over his words. You know, it's delivering Spock's eulogy of all the souls I've encountered in my travels. This was the most human. I mean, come on. I lost it. Uh, I saw Star Trek two four times in the theater opening day, by the way. Um, it's true. Uh, Crixus Maximus says, Mike Bond, I still love it. I just, I just left it behind when all the cigarette smoke in the clubs was literally making me sick. I don't know what you're referring to. I say, I missed that when I go back and try and read comments. Um, Anthony Gonzalez says that first novel in the series Game of Thrones reads like a mystery novel. It totally does. It and that's one of the reasons I love my mystery novels. I read a lot of contemporary mystery stuff. That's why I've loved the books of Don Winslow um, and his cartel stuff. Which is if if you guys want to read a powerful trilogy of books about Mexican drug cartels and politics and all that, they're great. You, I, I, I say it's the Lord of the Rings of Mexican drug cartel stories, but. Don Winslow's The Power of the Dog, uh, The Border, or The Cart Cartel, and his new book, The Border. Incredible. Uh, fantastic books. Amazing stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I can't recommend those books highly enough. Kevin Clark says, Terry Flynn, I live in Ontario and go to the theater fairly often, and I've never had a really bad experience with the audience. That's good to know. Um Harris says, did you guys hear that a guy got beat up for shouting Endgame spoilers to cinema goers? Yes, that happened actually in Hong Kong. I read that today. Um, <laughs> somebody came out of the theater and was spouting Infinity or Endgame, um, <laughs> Endgame spoilers and he got beat up. You know, to be honest, I don't, I, I don't, I don't advocate violence in any way, but there were people that were sending me DMs in on Twitter just with end, end game spoilers. So, you know, I would, I wouldn't, I would open it up and see. And to me, the, and what they would do is they would leave space. So you wouldn't know what they were saying. So I didn't know if I knew them or not. And I leave my DMs available so people can DM me, even if they're not my friends. Like I, I let that. And, and it's, it's a public trust issue. Like I, 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 I figure doing these chats and being on, now I'm on the John Campy show before I was on Collider Heroes. There were a lot of fans and doing the Schmodown. And there's a lot of people that want to ask me questions or things. So I I leave my, my um, DMs open. And it's amazing when you see people abusing the public space in, in that way. I mean, it doesn't, oh, there's Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I, I wonder if I can get her. She's working today. Um, 
Is anybody here? Do you have a call? Do you have, I have a house call? Oh, she has a house call. She. she said, uh, I could, we could talk later. She can talk later. Oh, she's leaving. Bye. She's leaving. She's 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 Elizabeth is a she's a fine artist, but she's also a hairstylist. She had her own salon that she actually moved into our house. So we actually, if you ever come to Los Angeles and you want a great haircut, you can come to our house. You can DM me on Twitter. Um, but anyway. You know, it's it's interesting in my own experience. People have been because I've said, "Don't spoil the end game." I've set myself up, but there's just people that have just typed spoilers in, and I've talked about this. I talked about this before, but you know, you get pissed off and annoyed when people do that. It's like, why would you do that? Why why would you go and vandalize? I mean, to me, it is sort of a it you're it is abuse. You're and not only that, it's abuse of strangers. You're going somebody who's self professed love of this material. And there are people in the public eye, and they'll just come, and people will abuse you. Now, I understand that. You know, I'm thick-skinned. But what I'm fascinated by is that there are people that are doing that. And it makes you realize, it's like, well, you know, when the zombie apocalypse comes, those are the people that are going to join uh, Negan and his group. Negan? Gonna, and, and that's where they come from, <laughs> you know? Just Plain Steve says... Pre-ordered the Hot Toys Endgame cap figure. Now it's the waiting game. Going to be a long year. They're holding off on revealing some accessories. Okay, for those who just plain Steve is talking about Hot Toys, everyone knows I have an affinity for Hot Toys. I have not bought a Captain America Hot Toys since the first Avengers. So I was very happy to see, well, let's just say that um, it's it's cool to have that first Avengers cap displayed here in my case. Um and I've I've wanted the new caps because I the first the first Avengers costume I really like what they did with him more later in terms of his costume. But the the Hot Toys um, Endgame cap figure that they just announced this week I also pre ordered that figure. And yes, what people don't understand is when you pre order Hot Toys figures, it can sometimes take up to two years before they actually get released. So like I forget. Like if you go to Sideshow Toy, which is the uh, North American distributor of hot toys, I think Big Chief is the distributor in the UK or maybe in Europe. I'm not sure, but if you go there now, they know that you have you have to put like usually twenty bucks, twenty five bucks down as a uh, as a it's a deposit that goes toward your purchase. But what happens is sometimes, and, and this this you know if you're not if you're not real flush, which has happened to me, sometimes you can't buy the figures. You're in no position to buy them when they come out and you lose your deposit. That's how I come. I don't have a Hulk buster. I had put my deposit down the Hulk buster and couldn't afford it when it came out. I know boo hoo hoo white people problems. I get it. First world problems, uh, not white people problems. First world, maybe s geeky cis white male problems. <laughs> oh, now all the girls who love hot toys are going to come screaming at me. I meant to say these are geek problems. These are post geek singularity problems. How about that? Um, but yes, so I ordered that Captain America figure, but yeah, you have to wait for like a year, year and a half, whenever it's going to come out. And the worst part is, is then once they're released, these figures get released in Asia because they, they're first out in Asia, then it takes, they're on, they're on the slow boat from China coming over here. So it could take, I mean, I've been looking at people with their Thanos infinity war figures for like months. They haven't even told me, uh, my, my Dr. Strange figure there, it's supposed to come in finally next week but i ordered that how long ago you know that was an infinity war figure that was ordered over a year ago and and the thanos figure they say oh it might come between april and july you know so you never know but yes the infinity war hot toys or the end game hot toys figures are are pretty dope i don't know if i'm you know the cap the cap and the thanos were really and and nebula were the only ones that they haven't released a Nebula figure, and the Thanos figure comes with the armor, and the Guardians of the Galaxy Hot Toys figure is a little too small now. Anyway, you guys, I digress. You're probably going, what the hell are you even talking about? I know. Uh, uh, Terry Flynn says, Vesta and I should watch Endgame together. We needed each other to grip and give tissues to each other. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to have seen that. Efren Guzman says, Robert, what action figures do you have from Star Trek? Also, it was always a dream of mine to have Spock meet the incarnation of the Doctor from Doctor Who. I can actually do that in 12 inches. How would you think they would fare as a team? I think Doctor Who and Spock, I mean, that would have been great. And and uh, I'm sure IDW could do that spinoff series. Like I, I've talked about, I want to see the Grandmaster and the Collector and uh, Howard the Duck go off on an adventure. I'd love to write that comic book. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Star Trek figures, I'll, I'll tell you, to be honest, I, I sold a lot. Like I had all of, well, most of the Playmates Star Trek figures. And there was a lot of figures I had in a storage locker that I lost. But I had the little Playmates figures that I, I sold because I decided to only go sixth scale. But I love the eight-inch, I guess their eighth scale uh, Star Trek figures that Playmates did. But now my, my, my figure collecting philosophy as I've gotten older is I just want the best incarnation of that character, no matter who makes it. I try and stay to six scale only. Uh, to that end, QMX, the QMX Star Trek figures are pretty great. Now, I have heard rumors. I don't know if this is this is known, but I know they're going to do. They have new face sculpts potentially for Kirk and Spock. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's actually true. But I love, I mean, I have Khan and their six scale um, captain's chair. Uh, Sulu and Scotty are on pre-order, and I have Dr. McCoy, but I never got Kirk and Spock, even though I wanted those. And those are the best 12-inch figures. They supplant any other Star Trek figures, so I'm just not interested in in any figures. If Once they've released what I consider to be a definitive version of that figure, I don't need that figure anymore. Like, for instance, if, if Hot Toys were going to do the Bounty Hunters from Empire Strikes Back, because above my above the glass case i've got my avengers glass case here that you're going to see shortly not today but shortly above that i've got star wars stuff and i do have i i have like ig88 and and bosk i can't imagine like they're doing they're doing commander cody hot toys is doing commander cody but i already have a lot of the hot the sideshow armor the 12 inch uh, armored figures that sideshow did of the clones the various clone troopers do i need to get a hot toys version of commander cody it's dope it's really great, but do I need to, you know, probably the answer is yes, I guess. But, you know, I only try and get the best incarnation of that figure. Then all the older versions are fair, 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 uh, fair game to be, to sell. Um, uh, Commander uh, Pesip, Pesip, Commander Pesip says, I have to disagree. Geeks may be mainstream now, but nerds are still a small minority as they've always been. Who from mainstream dig Dune, Foundation, Star Trek, the real one, etc. That didn't change. You know what? That's actually probably pretty true. You're that's that's an insightful comment. <laughs> nerds within our geek in geek community, yes, the nerds are still, you know, they they're they're nerds. They, I guess they're always nerds, but at least they have more acceptance. Nerds can now have geek friends that can be their conduit to the real world. Um, it's very interesting to me to now see, like I've seen other communities that have arisen, like the incel community that are geeks, but they're different. They've become nerds. I mean, they, it's very interesting to see how how things have shifted in the world. So I guess you're right about that. Uh, there are still nerds everywhere. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, Ted Rowe uh, says one continuity I liked that some people hated was the prequel to Carpenter's John the Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. I liked it rather than a reboot or a remake. You know what, Ted? I I what Ted is saying that of course they remade they didn't do a remake but they did do a prequel of what happened at the Norwegian camp. Um, I just thought that the over reliance on CG was kind of a bummer. I I agree with you. It wasn't a horrible film at all. But I did like the fact that they tried to stay in continuity. It's just, it's a weird, here's my problem when they did that. They should have, and I don't remember, maybe they tried. Was it set in 1982? Did they go back and do it that? I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, maybe they did. Um, Kevin Clark says, you can't expect too much from continuity when there's been years of content to look through. But what shouldn't change is the intelligence and roots of the property. Respect the idea. Kevin, that is a great point. Um, and I, I, I agree with you. But what I what I find what I find strange is there there is this idea that for instance, you know, with Star Trek, I've said it's a period piece, it's a history of the future, and you respect that 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 history. But one of the things that I have not understood is you can still th this idea that oh, there's cardboard sets you can and, and the special effects were were dodgy, not at the time they weren't, and the Star Trek bridge, the classic Star Trek bridge. It's just the details that date it. You could keep that exact same bridge, change out the 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 buttons maybe, and add a little bit more art direction. I mean, the bridge is pretty stark when you really, and I'm having been involved with a 
a uh, fan film where we actually re we built a bridge. What I wanted to do was add a lot more to it, art direct a lot more to it. You can actually see that bridge. And to me, it looks barren. And one of the things that I wanted to do was add a lot more uh, detail because the more relief you have, just things going on, the original bridge of, say, the Enterprise has a lot of empty space. And that that sort of is what you need. It's the details that make it look better. You create different, the, the screens can stay the same. It's what you put on those screens that make it um, make it more updated and the way you light it. You can take the exact same set and light it in different ways. If you look at, and I've always said, if you work in production and you look at a World War II movie, like some of my favorite World War II movies from the 60s, like Where Eagles Dare, when they go in, in, to interiors in that film, they're clearly interiors that are on a soundstage because they're lit like they're on a soundstage. And you can tell. And that sort of betrays you can tell what year these movies were made because film stocks have become faster. Lenses are different now. Lighting is, there's just much different ways to shoot movies. But if you were to go in and, and my perfect example of how you can make a World War II movie, if you go back and you look at World War II movies, like something like The Longest Day or A Bridge Too Far, you go back and look at movies like The Guns of Navarone or Where Eagles Dare or even, even Patton. Patton's interesting because it's a lot more naturalistic. It 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 was shot on location, and there's a lot of of natural lighting that they use. But if you go and look at Saving Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan, set in World War II, look at that opening scene, 45 degree shutter angles, and all the things they use to make that movie look the way it looks. Um, it looks very different than the World War II movies of the 60s. Still, same World War, same costumes, same armor. You're not changing the details, but it's the way, the actual way the film was shot that updates it and gives it a modern feel. Handheld, newspaper, combat photography. I mean, it. You, you, if you applied that, I mean, they do that a lot of the time with whip pans and J.J. Abrams. I mean, I think the idea of lens flares is wrong. I mean, they were literally shining lights into the camera to create these flares. Well, one of my problems with that is nobody on a bridge it's dark. The bridge should be dark. You wouldn't have lens flares because in an emergency, you don't want lights shining into people's faces. You want to be able to read your controls. That's why, like, for instance, in a modern edit bay, when we go in color time, it's a dark room. So the technician has all of his buttons lit up. So nothing is shining in his face. What are you saying, Gilbert? Gilbert is here. Would you like to, would you like a cookie, Gilbert? Uh, it's Saturday. I know Gilbert, when I'm, when I'm home and I'm, I'm uh, talking, and Gilbert, he doesn't like it when he he doesn't have a lot of uh, attention given to him. Come, come here, buddy. Come here. Come up. Good boy, buddy. Here, yeah, buddy. Don't you love that? Don't you just love how these cookies sound? I do. I just love it so much. Right, buddy? Yeah, dude. Oh, all right, give me a kiss, baby. Hey, you want another one? You want one more? I'll give you one more. Just to hear you do it by this. Here, come on. the best i love this dog don't you love this dog yeah buddy. yeah buddy i love this dog i have this weird kermit the frog yoda voice yeah dude but i always talk to him and I don't, okay have one more you get four but then that's it that's it i can't get enough i can't get enough of that that's all you get buddy that's all you get dude come on dude yeah bro uh yeah that's so uh, that's gilbert he makes an appearance He's, uh, he doesn't like it. I was playing with him earlier. We play this game. And I throw things from the, uh, in our bedroom has a porch that goes into our backyard. So I stand at the back door of the, of, of my bedroom of the porch and I throw whatever his toy of choice is. And he runs out and he's got about four or five fetches in him and he brings up and flies from the door onto the top of the bed, which is actually pretty funny. And I haven't been doing that. And he's like, what's up? And then he likes when I go, we have a vegetable garden in the backyard too. And when I go water the vegetable garden, he likes to come hang out. So that's why he's, I don't know what this has to do with anything. But um, yeah, what, let's see what anybody else has to say. Um, Captain Robert April says, a geek-themed pub, Free Enterprise meets East Enders. I'm in. May I suggest a village in eastern Oxfordshire? I was kind of hoping to go set this place up in Broadchurch, <laughs> where is, you know, that that town in Broadchurch. I'm, I'm, I want to live there. <laughs> I want to. I want to be. I want to take drunken walks up those like white cliffs of Dover and Broadchurch, <laughs> if I don't fall out. Uh, Pre-live teaser says Fab Cafe is a geek bar in Manchester, full of toys, posters, and film props. Even a Dalek. I've not been there for a while. That sounds good to me. 
let's go in. But it wouldn't that that you know what that that bar lacks me. It lacks me. <laughs> um, Sauron Merciful says so many spoiler reviews. Some people are taking picture shots of entire scenes of Endgame, which I have to give it a skip pass. Give us a chance to see the movie. Look, I agree. I don't understand why. Like, where? What is the delight people get? I mean. You're just why, why the, the the impulse of the need to spoil uh, a movie for people that obviously has such global reach and such excitement around it. That's the thing that baffles me because that you're intentionally trying to hurt people. Now, I know it's just a movie and it's not like it's we're in Syria or something and people don't have homes left to go to. But but it's it's you know, there's. How much joy is there in the world? There's actually people that want to do that. That want to. Why? Why do we live in that world? I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get that. I really don't understand the point. I mean, I understand the point. The point is to hurt people, which I've. I guess I've never understood. Uh, the pair says Age of Ultron is underrated. I love Age of Ultron. I've talked about it a lot, like on Collider Heroes and also on John Campy's show, I've talked about the fact that I could watch my dinner, you know, my dinner with Andre, where they, there's, you're watching a dinner for two hours. I could literally watch my dinner party with, or my my after party with the Avengers, where they're sitting around shooting the shit for two hours. You know, I could watch that. I love Age of Ultron. I think it's a lot of fun. I love James Bader. You can barely see the edge of my Ultron figure right here. You know, it's funny. Not a lot of people, there's a lot of Hot Toys figures that just don't sell because people don't want him. The Ben Kingsley Mandarin figure, which is a dope figure. It's so good. It comes with a chair, too. Uh, no one bought it. And Ultron, no one bought Ultron. Uh, it's a great figure. I mean, it's you'd want it to be metal. It's plastic, but he lights up. And if you go to Big Bad Toy Store, and if you want to buy, if you want to drop the green on Ultron, it's an expensive figure, but they give you, like, I don't, they they have, and this is true of most of the the J.J. Abrams Star Wars trilogy characters, not the main characters, but like you can get a two pack of Finn, or if you buy Han, the Han and Chewie, the old Han and Chewie, it was like five hundred bucks for the two pack. But then they give you like two hundred and fifty dollars store credit, so you're getting it half off, and you get two hundred and fifty dollars credit. It's pretty dope. Um, uh, but Ultron was that way because nobody wanted Ultron. I loved Ultron because I love James Bader. And um, how how excited is everyone to get Tough Turf on Blu-ray? Uh, Hassan Chavez is here. Some people say Endgame promotes sexism, body shaming, mocks PTSD and depression. Good movie. Two girls next to be almost fainted. Oh my God. I, I, I was waiting for those pieces to come up. Some people say Endgame promotes sexism, body shaming, mocks PTSD and depression. Are you kidding me? I mean, no, you're not. I know. I know what you're saying. Mocks. How does it mock depression? Captain America is 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 running a, a, a at the VFD or the VFW VFW. He he's he's running an encounter group for people who are suffering from post traumatic stress. Is that is that is that mocking them because one of the members of that group happens to be gay? It, that's ridiculous. And um, body shaming. How is it body shaming when somebody lets themselves go to seed because they're depressed? They've fallen into the bottle. Um, Anyway, if that's something that happens, I mean, that's, you know, in the movie, that's ridiculous. I mean, this is the problem of the world we live in. That becomes a thing. I mean, it's like everybody's, a, what are we all supposed to be perfect people all the time? It's really interesting that no, we're no longer dealing with the reality of life anymore. I mean, what, eventually it's going to come out that all superheroes are just body shaming the rest of us. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Um. Two girls next to you almost fainted. There was somebody behind me I was worried about fainting. Stubble McShave says, trolling and spoiling is for losers to get a fix from affecting another person's experience. It makes them think they can have an impact on the world. That's probably, I'm sure there's some truth in that. It's a sad truth, but, you know, the, the funny thing is, you have a much, you you can go go create something of your own. Why, why diminish, you know, if anybody, if you want to diminish an individual's but to me, that's you know, it's one of the basic tenets when I talk about the sovereignty of the individual. I mean, the idea that somebody would go out there and, and literally try and attack people's don't be a destroyer of joy. It's it's amazing. 
Johanna from Canada says, Hey Rob, I love your voice. You're the best storyteller. Well, these aren't my stories. I'm just, I'm just reading. Well, some of them are, I, I guess I, I are mine, but I'm reading, you know, I'm reading from people's I'm, you know what I'm doing really. I'm just, this is just a, a, a sub, uh, this is, here's what I'm doing. This entire chat series is just me honing my voice to figure out how I can become a books on tape reader. <laughs> uh, like my friend Tanya is, uh, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, hey, Rob, love your voice. You're the best storyteller. Would you ever consider doing a movie night commentary and we can all watch along? That's not a bad idea. You know, I did last summer, I did um, a drunk commentary. I was going to do drunk bond commentaries, but I've, I've been trying to like lay off the sauce here at home. So, uh, uh, but it was pretty funny and I should cut it together. I did Moonraker and uh, it was, it was pretty funny. Um, uh, let's see. Dieter Bastian says, Fr oh, Dieter Bastian says, Friday box office, Captain Marvel was second. Rob, what's happening? Well, as Dieter is pointing out all the way from Germany, yes, the number two movie in the United States this weekend was, in fact, Captain Marvel. Now, there are some conspiracy theories out on the web saying Disney demanded this because they wanted to put Captain Marvel's box office up above $450 million. Are you kidding me? All that stuff, people who don't understand how the studios work. But it is amazing that Captain Marvel has now, it, it's the same thing that happened with Black Panther. Black Panther jumped back in uh, to the top five when Infinity War came out. It's following that same pattern. I think it's great. Captain Marvel has made over $400 million domestic. Huge hit beyond any of their expectations. And a movie that I really liked, I um, thought it was great. And it's cool that it is back. That's the kind of world we live in. That's the kind of excitement that uh, we live in. I think it's great. Um, let's see. Uh, Mark Tumel says, uh, Mark Turmel says, I'm watching uh, a marvelous scene playlist on YouTube. Most of them are pretty insightful. That's cool. I don't know what that is, but that sounds cool. Um, Hero Journalism says, saw Endgame, was stoked. I avoided spoilers. Uh, though I did get one thing spoiled, ironically, from a troll in one of RMB's chats. Man, I am so sorry about that. I I, I apologize. Um, I do apologize. Thank, thankfully, it wasn't for me. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Uh, Willow Yang says, "I'd buy audiobooks read by Rob." <laughs> well, you know, you know what I want. My friend Darren Dockerman, who's one of the inglorious Trek experts, Darren. I don't know if you've heard any of those podcasts, but he you gotta you gotta listen to the Inglorious Trexperts podcast when he's reading from the Star Trek the novelization Star Trek the Motion Picture novelization and he does all the characters because it's great and he does a great Gene Roddenberry. But I thank you about that for that, Willow. I I don't know what books I would want to read. Um, it'd be interesting. Applestone Production says, Luckily, I saw Endgame on the night of release, so when I went to school, I didn't get spoiled by the riot of trolls. But my girlfriend heard the big spoiler. I feel so bad for her. Wait a minute. Oh, she'd seen it probably. I was gonna say you didn't take you didn't take your girlfriend on the night of the release, but that's a bummer. She'd saw that before you. That's too bad. Um Crixus Maximus says a lot of articles are spilling endgame in their blood headlines. <laughs> Some have even spoilers in the headline, and I have a spoiler warning at the top of the article. I know it's crazy. You know, I posted an article that was in the LA Times today, but I figured you kind of know about the physics of certain things that happen in Endgame. And people are like, was that a spoiler? I guess, I guess it was. But, um, you know, it's making a lot of money. Uh, Patrick Glanville says, there's a twist at the end of Endgame that will annoy MAGA. <laughs> yeah, there's there's one, there was a scene that I actually really liked. Uh, just, it's just a quick thing in, in uh, Endgame that I'm sure is driving a lot of people crazy. Uh, I loved it, but it's just a quick thing. It was cool. Um, let's see, uh, around the clock says, I fucking hate the sound of the cookie chewing. <laughs> How can you hate the sound of the cookie chewing? I love it so much, <laughs> but I can understand. It just sounds so great on this microphone, especially through the headphones. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, Crixus Maximus says, r &B, how the hell do you share a home with a Gilbarian and a Flirk? And in the end, there can be only one. Well, they they have developed a sort of interesting truce, you know, in the house. Uh, Skippy, Skippy, like many cats, Skippy John Jones is sort of, she walks around with her head held high. And uh, Gilbert tries to play with her, but she 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 feigns uh, disinterest. I think she's really interested because she they now can exist together. She doesn't just run away from Gilbert anymore. She did. Now, Gilbert is getting a sister. Uh, who is back east, but 
she's getting a sister, uh, Tallulah, the Tulularian from the planet Tallular. And uh, Tallulah is a um, Irish doodle, half Irish setter, half uh, poodle. And she's got red hair, and I don't know how that's going to go. It'll be interesting. We're supposed to acquire her in, in a couple of weeks when she's done. She's at a, a trainer's now, and and uh, this is something Elizabeth did. You'll have to ask her what's going to happen. I don't know. It's going to be crazy here, and I don't even know how we can live in this house with two of these giant dogs. And Gilbert has no idea what's coming for him, but he loves all dogs, so it could work out. Uh, the pair says, number one, Infinity War. Number two is Winter Soldier. And number three is Age of Ultron. I can only assume those are your favorite MCU movies. Um, that's good. I, I like that list. Kevin Clark says, I agree with you about old sets to a degree. Updating the lighting and cameras and the original bridge style can look good, but they could use more ambient lights and textures. I completely agree with that. And there's no reason why you can't do that. One of the things that really irks me about the last 10 years of Star Trek sets is how much space, if you look at some of the rooms, like Captain Pike's quarters, they have these gigantic these gigantic rooms with these floors that obviously need to be polished. And I just look and I'm like, or where where are these, these, these turbo lift? Where are they with open shafts that look like amusement park rides? I mean, what was so great about Doug Drexler's article was when he starts talking about the design aesthetics of things and one of the, my favorite things when i was a kid was getting this giant cutaway poster of the refit enterprise from the motion picture and you look at everything and you're like oh they really thought out exactly where everything was in this ship you know that's why i love the, the that ship so much is because you know where it all is you know where it all works how it and the new star trek doesn't have any of that i mean i'm sure john eves designs these ships or whatever but Where's the function in the form? Uh, there isn't any, and it drives me crazy. Uh, writer BL Alley says, uh, the original series was an aesthetic choice, not a budget choice. Absolutely. The new visual effects only changed the digital displays but left the other elements. Tactile controls make more sense than touch screens. I, you know, I tend to agree with that too. What's, what's really interesting is I think there's another, there's something else that's wrong-headed. As our, as this, as this world uh, moves forward, we want to continually update the future based on where we're at technologically now. So the Star Trek futures as first portrayed is 53 years old now, even older. If you go back to the cage aesthetic, um, which is different than the original series aesthetic. So I, I understand that. I agree with that, but what you're dealing with, the, I think the, 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 the perfect way that that was dealt with was in Blade Runner 2049. They made a decision and said, okay, the future as depicted in Blade Runner in 2019, Los Angeles, was one way it was aside from the flying cars it was a very analog future and and they continued with that the tools were big and and with in blade runner 2049 yes it moved on 30 years but that analog future was sort of retained and they kept those those things they updated certain things but it was a period piece and it wasn't our future it was a different future and it was great i thought it was really 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 cool that they did that and that, but again, that uh, takes vision, you know, that takes, you, you need somebody to, to rein in a good director is of course, overseeing all of this. And unlike television, where it's the producer's job and frequently, you know, it's interesting that writer producers show runners on, on these things are not always thinking about those kinds of things because they're thinking about story. So a lot of the time, I think that there is a disconnect, especially with science fiction shows between what the showrunners are, are doing and then what the art department is doing. And what you need is, is synergy or the, 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 the showrunners know, like in the case of Star Trek, when, when Mike Akuda and Denise were there and Doug Drexler was there, they knew that the art department, they, they trusted the art department to provide what was needed. You know, the, 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 as far as, you know, everything had to be approved, but they they still were coming up with things and the, the art department was trusted because everyone knew that they were working in tandem with everyone else. And the writers, you know, the good writers like the Ron Moores and things knew how to utilize the art department. And that was a big part of, I think, of um, the success of modern Star Trek, at least up until 2005. Um, Vesna says, yeah, Will or Yang, we're still waiting for your slash novels. Robert would need something good to read. <laughs> Well, if I had Willow, if Willow and I were in a cell, cells next to each other, I would just have her tell me her slash fantasies 
because that would be better than reading books anyway. Uh, Force Userish says, I'd definitely rather have had RMB on heroes on the heroes. <laughs> Force user ish says, I'd definitely rather have had RMB on the heroes panel review than freaking lame Roka. Look, I love I love Roka. I think he's great. Um, I just come at these things from a different perspective than he does. You know, we all have different backgrounds, and but Roka, he's a really nice guy, and I, I I've always liked him a lot, and uh, he's great. Crixus Maximus says the inside of Discovery looks like Space Mountain. That's probably what they sent to the uh, the special effects team. I mean, it's ridiculous. The, the it's ridiculous makes no sense at all. Uh, Stubble McShave says good omens will more or less start when Game of Thrones comes to a close. I think that's exactly what they planned on uh, was to start it after Thrones was over, which was a genius idea. Really like that. Um, uh, Willow Yang says, if you do want to read it first, I need something erotic in my life, says Dale M. <laughs> I think it's so funny that our, our PhD microbiology student has now become the repository of, of everyone's desire to get their slash fiction. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, Crixus Maximus also says Secret Wars would make a good movie now that the Marvel Universe is unified in the real world. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I think the idea of Secret Wars, you need all those villains. Uh, and the idea of the Beyonder, it goes a little far. I don't know. Um, Emil Johansson says, can I talk spoilers here? I would prefer you didn't until mo at least Monday. Um, only because there's a lot of people who haven't seen the movie. Um, Joe 88 says, I can listen to you all day. I'm a fan and telling everyone to subscribe. Well, Joe 88, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Tell everybody to subscribe. Um, the more subscriptions I get, the better off I am. <laughs> Andy, uh, Kluwell says the design of discovery is the least, is the least offending things in that show. <laughs> it's true. And by the way, the, the discovery design doesn't even come from the people. It, it was redesigned, but it was originally designed by Ken Adam. And Ralph McQuarrie, it was from the, the Planet of Titans idea. And that was Brian Fuller's idea to bring that design back, which I actually kind of thought, I kind of thought was cool. Bartimax says, modern spacecraft are still pretty analog. Touch screens are hard to operate with thick astronaut gloves. Analog switches are easy to operate in zero gravity too. TOS still looks pretty futuristic. I agree. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, Avi Negi says, hello. Oh, well, there you go, Avi. You're, you're, you, you've been, you've, I don't know what you were saying being from India. I didn't see that, but you've, you're gone now. <laughs> Anthony Gonzalez says the Rambo series ends this year. I hope it's as gritty as the first one and meaningful as the second one. Sly wrote it. I trust him in his writing. I've heard rumblings that it's quite good. Looking forward to it. Uh, you know, I, you go back and you watch the first, first blood. Well, the first Rambo movie, first blood, what a great film, a uh, great action movie. Really interesting. Uh, really like that a lot. It still works. Uh, Applestone Production says, my girlfriend went up to my PE teacher saying that people were talking spoilers for Endgame. <laughs> he closed his ears, started yelling gibberish, ran to the staff room and closed the door. <laughs> I love that PE teacher. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, uh, Henry says, Wheel of Time is currently in production by Amazon. It's the best fantasy I've read. I have to say, Wheel of Time, I have not read the Wheel of Time series. I'm very familiar with it. I can't wait that that series is getting made. I mean, between The Expanse, Wheel of Time, Dune, all of these great literary adaptations that we're getting, it's we live in great times, my friends. To see all of this literary sci-fi adapted, it really makes me happy and excited. Uh, Stubble McShave says, Willie Yang, love scenes are similar to action scenes in books. You don't want to depict every parry or thrust use all five senses sight may be the least important we agree or we eagerly await your slash fiction yeah i know i tend to tend to agree that that sex scenes in especially in non-pornographic films and unless they have a real unless they're furthering the plot unless the way people are having sex is pertinent to the story like i love basic instinct and the sex scenes and that definitely further the plot along but they it, it is kind of they do stop plots. As much as I love my sex scenes, and as long as they're good, uh, they don't um, they don't really add anything unless the reason for them is pertinent to the story. At least that's the way I've always thought. David Cabrera says, "Rob, did you just see the numbers for Endgame? One hundred and fifty-seven million just Friday." David, yeah, I started this chat by reading the deadline story about how much money the movie's making. Absolutely astonishing. Captain Brad Brickley is here. Hello, 
Mr. Captain Brad. Endgame to me was the culmination of a 22 chapter MCU epic built upon and paying off every film since Iron Man. We both were in tears at the start. Uh, live long and prosper. I agree, man. That opening scene of Endgame really got to me. I mean, it was rather than last time, you know, and uh, last time in the Avengers, they didn't do that. They recapped the entire movie. They recapped Infinity War with one scene that also was all about a character. And we wanted to know what was up with that character. It was such a great way to open that movie. What a ballsy way to open the film. So good. So good. Um, De Niro is here. Hello. Bonjour de France. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir. That's bonsoir de France. Uh, bonsoir to you, De Niro. Um, uh, Vesna says, so what is your prediction for worldwide box office? Um, I I think it's going to be over, you know, I having read, I, you mean total box office. I I think it's going to be 2.5 plus. I've been saying that, 2.5 plus. Uh, I think so. David Cabrera says, you called it 325 million plus. I guess I did, you know. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't think these kinds of box, if, if you're a fan of this material, these kind of box office procrastin pro prognostications procrastinations prognostications are not difficult i don't think difficult to make if you have if you're a, a student of pop culture you 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 are watching all of these trends and you've been into it the anticipation for this movie and the way they've they've built up to it i, I don't think a lot of people really understood the incredible appeal of of the marvel cinematic universe and i use myself as a gauge because i love all this stuff but and i understood like for instance I didn't grow up with Harry Potter, so I didn't read all the books. I read the first book. I didn't read any of the other books, but I understood the Harry Potter franchise and how popular it was. And while it just, I liked the movies, Harry Potter was just not my thing. However, I could look at it and see that for a certain generation of people that grew up with it, it was a big deal, but it had a limit. Harry Potter had a limit because older people like myself you know, why we liked it. I liked all the Harry Potter movies. It, I wasn't anticipating them the way I was anticipating this. Growing up and reading comic books, this is a, a four-quadrant film for fans. And living as we are all members of this, the post-geek singularity community, there's nothing that there's nothing like this that's ever existed. And these films haven't let us down. Like even Star Wars as a franchise, we had to get past now whether you like the prequels or not, as I've said, I think they're bad movies, but good Star Wars. The prequels severely diminished the excitement of Star Wars. I think for a lot of people, especially people that are older, that are more in my age bracket. So I'll go see Star Wars. And look, The Force Awakens, everybody went to see The Force Awakens because it brought back characters that we wanted to see for a long time. So, and there's no reason why it's not going to be successful. I don't think, however, just from my own point of view, I don't think that J.J. Abrams, and I call it the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Wars trilogy. I think that uh, bringing in all of these new characters and trying was a mistake. Ultimately, philosophically, it was a mistake because if this is a true conclusion of the Skywalker saga, and now Luke, Han, and Leia were all now part of that saga, with Han and Leia having given birth to kylo ren what should have happened is we should have seen a movie the force awakens really should have been about luke han and leia and then we've we we would introduce those characters and make you love those characters because they've already been interacting with our old characters that we all knew and love and you spin those characters out they started those movies i mean han han solo was in there but our classic characters like were like an afterthought that's why for instance Hot Toys have not sold as many of these new trilogy characters as they do of the old classic characters. That's why the the merchandising for modern Star Trek over the last 10 years, the these new characters have not permeated the consciousness of even people who like these movies as much as the classic characters have. It's a whole different vibe. It's a whole different feel. And uh, I don't think episode nine is fine, but we, even as a culture, we're invested in Star Wars, and these new characters have come along with Star Wars, but we don't, these characters have not penetrated the cultural zeitgeist the way that other Star Wars characters have. You know, there are people, sure, there's girls that are come growing up with Ray and love Ray and all that, but even in the movies, 
there's not enough that's gone on with these characters. We don't feel we know them. They just haven't done that much. They've had different instances within the course of these plots, but we don't feel there's any growth. Whereas we watch Luke Skywalker literally grow from being a boy into a man. We've watched that journey. These new films, there's there's really no character growth because there's nothing. The, the things that they're participating in are just analogs of what we saw before, and there's no new story to follow. Whereas the Marvel Cinematic Universe, what it did was for old guys like myself, who's I've been reading comics my, my whole life, they took the Marvel Cinematic Universe and gave us a character like Tony Stark, who we as adults, we immediately want to be. And then also younger people, they watch, they want to grow up and be Tony Stark. So the way the Marvel Cinematic use, Universe worked and permeated pop culture is something that is should be obvious, I think, to people. I mean, from that very first movie, Iron Man, Tony Stark is an irresistible character. You know, we have real guys in, in real life like this that aren't even as cool. Elon Musk was never as cool as Tony Stark, even though Elon Musk is pretty cool, but he's got his 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 detractors and his downside as well. But the Marvel Cinematic Universe has done a great job of making the world into believers. And that's why as a franchise, it worked. And it speaks to what Doug Drexler's article that I read at the beginning of this chat really laid out. Why do we love why do we love the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Because of those characters. And um that's why. Fellow Filthian says, two hours till endgame. Seems like forever. Fellow Filthian, does that mean you're seeing it for the first time? I think that's very cool. Thanks for supporting the channel, by the way. Javier Belmer says, saw endgame twice, cried and loved it more the second viewing. I did too. That frequently happens to me when I watch. I can sit back because I'm watching the story going, where is this going to go? Where is this going to go? But where I, when I know where it's going, I can sit back and relax and really really get into it. Um, HB uh, Haga says, kind of sad marvel doesn't have the micronauts license anymore with the quantum realm from ant-man they make a nifty inclusion i totally agree with you um for those of you who don't know micronauts which was based on a toy line was a one of the direct it was one of the first marvel direct sale only which means sold at comic book stores only no longer on spindle racks but it was moon knight micronauts and kazar or kazar uh were the first marvel direct sale only ongoing books I love Micronauts. It was directed or directed. It was uh, drawn by Michael Golden when it started. Those are great comics, and they could be. That wouldn't it be cool to see the Micronauts as part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? They could do that because they would be from the quantum realm, and that would be awesome. Uh, I would love that. Um, Pre Life <laughs> Teaser says, "Reboot the Red Hand Gang or the kids from Degrassi Street." Casig. <laughs> uh, uh, Kasigan, uh, Kasigan, Kasigan C, Kasigan C. I'm I'm mispronouncing. It. I'm I'm sure. Robert Meyer Burnett. What is the best ten entertaining films you would recommend? Oh my God, that's tough. Um, that's really hard. I mean, I the most entertaining films, not the best films necessarily. That's a really, that's a really hard thing. I mean, I think at the top of that list, one of the, in terms of just sheer entertainment for sheer entertainment value. The first thing that popped into my mind reading your question, Back to the Future. I think Back to the Future is an irresistibly entertaining movie on a number of levels from the beginning to the end. Back to the Future is an amazing, amazing film. It's incredibly uh, entertaining. Um but gosh, after that, what are what are some other movies that are that are I think are wildly? So I'm trying to I'm trying to think when I when I think in the question you're asking me, I'm I'm thinking about in terms of the general audience, what all people would find entertaining, not just not just me. Um, I think I think Back to the Future is the first thing that came to mind. You know what I think is a wildly entertaining movie, and again, The Martian, especially the extended version. I think The Martian is a wildly entertaining movie. I think even if you're not inter interested in space or science fiction, you can all get a, around the idea of somebody being stranded. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a wildly entertaining movie. I think anybody could just about get into Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, I think uh, that's, oh God, more, you know, I don't know. I, I, I have to come back to that question. But I, I'm thinking about wildly entertaining movies for everybody, for all tastes. Uh, those are the most entertaining movies, and that's tough. I think back, back. I'll stick with those though. I think Back to the Future, Raiders. You know, those are those are those are movies you can't go wrong with. But I'll have to think about the top ten. It's tough. 
Uh, Matthew Poole says, I don't mean to jump the gun. I <laughs> see what you did there. But Brightburn looks phenomenal. It does look phenomenal. Uh, I, I think Brightburn looks really, really good. Uh, for those who haven't seen the trailer for Brightburn, I won't describe what it is, but go watch the latest trailer. In a nutshell, it looks like the anti-Superman. What if Superman were evil? <laughs> I think. Javier Belmer says, I'm trying to think of the next MCU saga villain. You know, I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, everyone, I was always talking about Kang the Conqueror because he's such an Avengers villain. I mean, we're going to see Mysterio in Spider-Man uh, Far From Home. I'm, I'm very curious. I'm not going to ex explain why, but I'm really curious to see. One of the more, more interesting things I thought they did, it was subtle, but um, is we all know that Spider-Man Far From Home is coming out. I'm really curious. Does Spider-Man Far From Home take place post endgame and if it does something really interesting has happened and i wonder how they're going to deal with that in terms of spider-man's life don't know but uh mcu saga villains there's a lot i mean you could do i could see you know there's something maybe gilbert could be the villain uh what if they did something with the beyonder and of course i i do want galactus i really do willie yang says crixus maximus can't wait for parabellum that would be john week three neither can i just hope it's even half as badass as it looks in the trailers. It looks pretty damn badass. I can't wait. Um, uh, Crixus Maximus says, Rom Space Knight. Concept, yes. Armor design, no. But his but his retro armor is cool. I like Rom. Uh, Stubble McShave says, I was taken out of The Last Jedi when I saw Eddie Hitler from bottom in one of the first scenes. It went downhill from there for me. <laughs> uh uh, writer Beal Alley says, all of Hammer Industries is SpaceX. <laughs> I think that's pretty fun. That's pretty funny, dude. <laughs> um, that's, that is very funny. Uh, Mugen 008 says, walking the San Diego Zoo and listening to Rob's observations. Well, that's funny to think about. <laughs> I like that. Um, let's see. Uh, I think some of Iron Man 2 was filmed at SpaceX. Oh, is that true? Is that what you're referring to? Be all of Hammer Industries is SpaceX. That's what you're referring to. That's cool. I didn't know that. See, I read those things backwards. I did not understand that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joanna from Canada. I love saying that. Joanna from Joanna from Canada. Um, Mr. Burnett, did you ever see an 80s movie with Dennis Quaid called Enemy Mind? I certainly did. I own Enemy Mind on Blu-ray. It was directed by Wolfgang Peterson. ILM did some, they did the effects for that movie. Uh, Louis Gossett Jr. plays uh, the alien and Dennis Quaid is in it uh, called Enemy Mine. I would love for that to be remade. I could see that movie being remade. It's interesting that what I liked about that movie was as a special effects junkie, they, they, there's a lot of, they went back to some old school model work in that. Uh, and I think Enemy Mine's a respectable film. Um, now you make me want to go throw on my Blu-ray, which I can do. Uh, Just Plain Steve says, now that the Infinity Saga is wrapped up, obviously without giving away anything, who do you think had the best character arc these past 10 years? That's really an interesting idea. Who had the best character arc? Well, you know, the obvious answer to that is Tony Stark um, because of the way he started and where he winds up. I mean, I think that's definitely something. I like Tony Stark. And, of course, you know, Steve Rogers. And, in a way, um, I think the three principal characters thor because it really is thor iron man and and captain america i think they've done a good job and and all three of those characters certainly end in different places um and i like i like all of that and it was it was really interesting uh, i thought i thought all three of them because they really are the core avengers and i think the story arcs are theirs the the individual movies are theirs i mean uh, it'll be interesting to see where the character arcs go for I, I see their positioning, for instance, Doctor Strange is going to be one of the, I think, new heavy hitters. They'll probably, you've got Doctor Strange, Black Panther, and it'll be interesting to see who they make. The third person, maybe Captain Marvel, I would assume. So those are going to be the three big people going forward, I would imagine. I mean, who knows? However they're going to use our old characters, we'll see. I mean, we know they're filming Black uh, Widow uh, starting next month, but I believe that's a prequel. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll leave. I don't know. But um, I think the core Avengers pretty much had their 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 time. Jim Boyers is here. Thank you, sir. Good to see you here. Next Marvel villain, their own success. They must fight an earth-shattering war and not be a victim of it. I think that's a pretty astute comment to make. 
I wouldn't want to be Kevin Feige. I mean, Infinity War and Endgame, look, look, they've 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 landed. Talk about sticking the landing. As I've said, they've they've stuck the landing the way the Eagles stuck Tranquility Base back in fifty years ago in July of sixty nine. We'll we'll see what happens. Um, uh, fellow filthy and says, "I'm glad you, sir, and Schnapp and Campia are friends." Well, you know, of course, John's no longer with us, but. Uh, yeah, John Campy and I are, are friends. I really like doing the show with him. It's going to be fun. I think we're going to get into it tomorrow. I think John and I are going to, uh, we, we see, we don't see eye to eye on certain things. I think, uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens <laughs> with us tomorrow. Uh, it should be interesting to watch certainly entertainment. Uh, but yeah, Jim, it's going to be, I don't know how they're going to, if I was Kevin Feige, I would leave <laughs> like I really would. Because he's already proven, he already did this. I mean, twenty. what he did was unprecedented in human history. Man, you know what I would like to see? Here in a dream world, if I could live in a dream world, I want Kevin Feige to go take over Star Trek. If the Viacom-CBS merger happens, because I know Kevin Feige likes Star Trek. I, I know he loves Star Trek. If if And I don't think he could do it. He could, I, I don't think even he, as much as, bad robot and and secret hideout want to retain control i i think Ke kevin feige has the clout and um uh, yeah i would start begging him for a job if he did that <laughs> i don't know what job it would be but but um i'd really like to see kevin feige take over the star trek franchise because there's a lot of star trek in the mcu there really is uh, jared mcbride says i'm seeing avengers endgame tonight so excited i can't wait for the spoiler review tomorrow it should be a rousing spoiler review. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens. It's going to be pretty funny. Um, and Shay says, does Feige like Star Wars? I imagine. Um, Maurice D says, good question. He says, without spoiling it, does Endgame feel like it was inspired by all good things? It really does. It really does feel like it was inspired by all good things. It's different, but it does. Uh, Willow says, I actually enjoyed all the movies, but I imagine it'd be torturous to most people in the chat. Oh, I don't know which movies you were talking about. See, I should go back up and I miss that. I hope you're not talking about Fifty Shades of Grade. <laughs> uh, Angel Feliciano says, Secret Wars seems to be the next logical choice. My only thing about Secret Wars is I don't think they have enough villains to pull that off. Um, they just haven't introduced all, all the villains that you'd need. You otherwise it'd be very unbalanced. And you know, the idea of Secret Wars is not after what they've done now. I I, I think it's tough. I mean, it's I don't know what they're going to do. That's why I it'll be it'll be really interesting to see what's going to happen. I don't know. Uh, Word balloon says, "God, please, if only Feige would take Trek over." I I think that that's the next look. I, I don't mean I, what, what does my opinion matter. But I think if you're a man like Kevin Feige and you make the 22 Marvel movies and you've done this and Endgame, you're going out on the highest note you can go out on. You've literally are going to make it, it could it could I don't know if it will, but it could take down Avatar as the highest grossing film of all time. If that's the legacy that you're going to leave, you made these 22 movies that over a, a decade. No one's ever done this. No one's ever done this in Hollywood history. And what what needs the Kevin Feige treatment more? than star trek uh, i mean i think it really does i think star trek over the last 10 years has really ultimately diminished a brand that should look nobody thought iron man was ever going to be what it was going to be when it came out people didn't know if it would work uh, they didn't know if the marvel cinematic universe would work we're now in a position right now where i think the star trek brand has been damaged literally been damaged by the last and that's not to take away again from people who like star trek discovery but the fact that it's divisive at all, I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, while people might not have been that interested, look where he built it to. That's what Star Trek should have been. It, it, somebody with the proper vision who knew Star Trek. I mean, Alex Kurtzman and J.J. Abrams both talked about, well, they, it was Bob Orsi who was the, the, the Star Trek fan of the bunch. And now people that were not self-professed Star Trek fans took over. Look, if Kevin Feige took over the Star Trek franchise... He already understands the Star Trek franchise, which is evident in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it would be really interesting to see him come take that over because what there's your next challenge. How can we, and of course, with the pressure, how can we turn the Star Trek franchise into something that's as beloved as the Marvel Cinematic Universe? It could be done. It could be done with the right, with the right vision. And um, 
I, I think, as John uh, Suntra said, it can be one, you're one great movie away from that. Uh, Joe Espen says, what would happen if two continuities would merge? I don't know, as long as it was done correctly. I mean, they, they tried to do that in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Many continuities merged. Um, uh, Captain Robert April says, a possible tease for Phase 4. Four Fury says, into the phone, get me Dr. Richards. It's true. Um, that, that could be great. Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it'll be really, really interesting. Well, guys, girls, gentle beings, non-binary folk, aliens of every, you know, I read a, th a story today on, on, in the news. I think I read it. It was in the guardian or something. I don't know. There is a Korean, uh, I want to say he's at Yale. He's a Yale or Harvard professor who wrote a book saying that aliens are already here and they're interbreeding with humans. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'd like to believe that's true. I like, I like, I wanted to believe that uh, Bat Boy and the Weekly World News was 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 real, but unfortunately not. Um, but anyway, I want I want to end this chat uh, this afternoon. This is another great chat. I want to thank everybody for the continuing support, and I especially want to thank Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products. These chats would uh, no longer be possible without the great and warm sponsorship of Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products. They are for men who want to look good and feel great. As a matter of fact, before I came on this morning, I was taking a shower. I don't know why my last, uh, the first chat that I had set up disappeared, which was weird. I set it up, went to take a shower, and I use Lucky Tiger uh, face scrub, which actually has bamboo in it, which gives it a little bit of, uh, of feeling. And I love that about Lucky Tiger products. They're a sponsor of this channel. Their uh, CEO, actually their president, I found out, Alan Murphy, is going to be on. I did an interview with him that I'm going to share with you this coming week. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I I, I didn't want to I didn't want to go I didn't want to do it live. I thought about doing it live, but I figured for him, for his sake, I want to be easy for his first time. I'll get him to come on again. But I did a uh, interview. I I pre-recorded it so I could edit it out, and make sure that he was taken care of, and that Lucky Tiger was well represented. But he even he acquitted himself. He even had mentioned how much he liked the Alien franchise. So kind of cool. Anyway, Lucky Tiger men's grooming products. You can get Lucky Tiger men's grooming products at getluckytiger.com. And I'm working on getting you members of this the Post Geek Singularity community a twenty percent discount code that will be coming up and. I did a really interesting chat with uh, James Hills, who does a, a blog about traveling the world, and I actually interviewed him on a brand new Norwegian cruise boat that was in Vancouver. He was there checking it out, and it uh, sounded amazing, and that's going to be up on the Club Lucky Tiger website. That's at clubluckytiger.com. You can check that out. I'm going to do some content for them, and I did an interview with him. He was actually, he was it was kind of fun. It was in the in one of the, I guess, one of the cafes on this brand new cruise ship. There's a lot of people hustling and bustling around, but he has a full schedule this weekend. He was one of the reporters that is covering uh, this boat. And I did an interview with him that's going to be on the Lucky Tiger, Club Lucky Tiger, um, um, uh, Club Lucky Tiger website. So check that out. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's going to be a cool little piece. So I'm excited about that. And also, there's the Inglorious Trexperts podcast you got to listen to. There's also the Best Movie, Worst Movie podcast that I'm still doing. And go to the website, theburnetwork.net. You want to send me letters, I'm going to continue to read letters. I'll be back here tomorrow, by the way, at noon with more letters, more things to say. I'm, it'll be crazy to see where the box office for Endgame is going to go. And then all next week, I'll be on the John Campy Show. I'm not going to be on the John Campy Show on Monday morning. There's some work I have to do regarding tango shalom i haven't told john that but uh i won't be on on monday but anyway uh oh crixus maximus says sing a lucky tiger jingle rob i don't know if there is a lucky tiger jingle uh if there is one i i, I will sing it i don't know if there is one but i don't know the words i'll have to get that but anyway, go to theburnetwork.net. Uh, there's uh, the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery is there. So if you have something you want to share with the community, please go there. There's a form to fill out, and there's a way you can submit photos of any kind. Send your collections. I love pictures of collections of any kind, uh, models you're building, action figures you've got, even artwork you did as a kid. I mean, whatever you've got, put it in the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery. It's a place where we can all share our geekdom and that's great. That's up on the Burnetwork also, burnetwork.net. Go check it out. And with that, I'm going to bring this 
Rob Observations live chat number 105 to a close. I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for supporting the channel. Please subscribe, like these videos, comment on these videos. I'm just blown away by everyone's feedback, and I want to thank everybody for being nice participants and for continuing to grow this channel. I'm actually closing in on 10,000 subscribers, which, you know, for a channel that's only been around since the end of December, not bad. So I want to thank all of you for that and tell your friends, and uh, we're having a good, a good time, you know, and I think all of your ideas like book clubs and watching movies and doing content like that is uh, is all a good idea. And there's going to be more. I've got I've got people I want to be doing these chats with. I've got some correspondents I'm going to be bringing in from different different areas, uh, different kinds of people that will offer different perspectives. And I'm pretty excited about that. There's a couple people I've asked if they would be interested and they've said yes. So that's going to be fun. And uh, we're just going to keep growing this community. So with that, I will bid you all a good day and have a better day. That's what I always say. Have a better day. And how can you not when movies like Endgame are in the theaters and we're going to see the Battle of Winterfell tomorrow, yo? Maybe tomorrow will be an all Game of Thrones chat. Uh, and we can all talk about who we think is going to die and who is going to live. I mean, check it out. There's only three episodes of Game of Thrones left after tomorrow. Only three. I'm deeply saddened by this. Anyway, thanks for all being here. I appreciate your participation. It's great to have you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday and have a better day.